Good evening, everybody. Welcome to tonight's edition of the Triangle Area SQL Server User Group's very special SQL Server User Group meeting. Uh, this is very special because, well, Tracy and I accidentally um, double booked, and Thomas was polite enough, nice enough to uh, reschedule with us. So we appreciate him coming at us on a strange day, a Thursday. And with that, I'm going to hand it straight off to him. So take it away, please. OK. Hello, everybody. Um, I wish I could have been there in person, but that's yet not possible. So we have to wait for next year. But I will do my best to talk to my monitor and have zero feedback. <laughs> so sorry about that. So today, we're talking about scaling SQL Server beyond two CPUs. And I already started lying to you, because while I was making building the presentation, uh, I figured out I can't start at two CPUs. I have to start at one single core, uh, because otherwise um, it's hard to explain why certain things happen. So the new title is Scaling SQL Server Beyond One Core. Um, so let's get started. Um, I don't know if you can see the animations or not. The internet is actually not bad here, but we'll see. So. I assume that most people know me in this area, but here's a little query about me. My name is Thomas Grosser. Um, I'm a database infrastructure architect, engineer, fancy words for I build large SQL servers. Um, been with SQL Server for many, many years. I started in 1994 uh, when 16-bit was top of the line and I never stopped doing it. I contributed a lot to uh, publications and I speak and yell a lot at the product team to make things better. Um, moving on. So, before we start looking at hardware, we, we have to learn how we can compare stuff because this is this apples and oranges, but actually we want to compare oranges and not apples and, and all this. Yeah? And the problem is it, it's when you have to compare apples and oranges, it's really hard. And vendors make it actually super hard because they cannot agree on anything. That has to do with patent law because they cannot build the exact same thing because then the other guy sues them. But it also that they love to build things different so people cannot compare what's better. Yeah? Because if you have 50 different criterias and each one of them wins in 25 of them, how do you know that's the 25 you actually need? Yeah, or how many of them you actually need. So this is the tricky part. And I hope that this presentation will give you a little bit of an idea yeah, uh, how this goes. Yeah. Then there's the problem that sometimes apples and oranges can be mixed together. And then comparing them to something else gets even harder. Yeah. And as you can see, a little piece of mint might be on top of that. Um, Sometimes a vendor tries to disguise an orange inside an apple, um, and that is even harder to spot uh, for the untrained eye. Yeah. And then, of course, there's one more problem in the whole thing. When you have a clear apple and a clear orange, and you could see, hey, they're different, then one more department gets involved, and they're called marketing, and they are disguising everything. And yes, when I used this animation the first time, Someone immediately pointed out that I have to add one more picture. Uh, so, uh, Andy <laughs> looks just like my marketing oranges. Um, so, the problem is you cannot just directly compare stuff. You need to really understand how it works. Yeah? Uh, if you have two identical CPUs with 16 cores, one is from Intel, one is from AMD, they run both at the same clock speed. They both have the exact same memory. They both run on a identically functional motherboard. They will not be the same performance. And that's where it gets tricky. Yeah. So um, during my practical life, the, the second hardest thing, because besides understanding how to compare things is, how to limit it to a reasonable amount of cases when you evaluate something. And what it boiled down is, over the last 10 years or so, I limited it to four 
use cases. And with these four use cases, I can cover 99% of whatever companies that I work for need. Sometimes there's something crazy thing outside that, but these four cases cover whatever it is. So you need to know what kind of workload you're running before you can look at how you can scale SQL Server to run that very good. So the first one is low latency workload. This is stupid workload. This means it's single threaded, it comes into SQL Server, it runs one query and has to wait for that query to finish before it can do anything else. And then it sends the next query and then the next. Yeah. So you want that one to be answered as fast as possible. But I've had to tune machines where there was literally one active spit at a time. They never had two queries running at the exact same time. And they were constantly complaining how slow the database is. I'm like the database is super fast. Your application is stupid. But hard to explain that to someone who does not understand what that you can run two things at the same time. The second one is high concurrency OLTP. That means hundreds, thousands of connections at the same time doing very small tasks. Uh, prime example is you have a supermarket chain and they have 10,000 supermarkets and each one has 20 registers open. And every time you scan, you have to insert something in your database. That is the perfect workload for that. One record, couple of bytes, but thousands of them at the same time. Yeah, that's the second workload we're going to look at for each and every technology and everything we're examining today. We are looking if it's good for these individual workloads. The third one is high throughput. That's your data warehouse. Yeah? Uh, lots of data and you're reading it over and over again. Yeah? Very usually not that many connections. I mean, it's getting more. Yeah, because more and more people want something from the data warehouse, but we're not talking thousands of connections. We're talking tens, maybe a hundred, maybe 200. I've rarely seen more people or more applications connected at the same time to data warehouse. What I'm seeing a lot is that each one of them pretty much wants to read all the data all the time. Because some queries are not efficient, but in these days, there's not much time to tune stuff like this, especially with ad hoc analytics being more and more mainstream and people just torturing these machines. And the fourth one is generic servers and virtualization. Your I don't care box. This is this is nothing special. This is it, I just need a SQL server. It doesn't have to be high end, but I don't want to waste money. Yeah? So it's not like it's a crappy server. It's still a good server, but it doesn't need anything super special. Yeah? So average is just perfect for this machine. Yeah, that's my first workload. I will tie each and every feature to it. So how this works in this talk is every time you see a slide that looks like this and you have submitted questions through the chat, um, Kevin is going to ask me these questions. So we'll stop here for the first time. Anybody has any questions on the intro? So there haven't been any questions so far. However, yep. Yep. we'll see. Uh, might might be about a minute or so uh, because yeah. it takes roughly 20 seconds for the people to have a chance to fill in any of those details and mm -hmm. start yeah. typing in that, hey, I've got a question. But um, I like the, the last one it reminds me of a Mad TV sketch, Lowered Expectations, the dating service. <laughs> yep. Could be so yeah you can so before we start going into the practical cases we have to learn about the theory of parallel workloads what does it mean to do things in parallel because it sounds easy but it's actually not and we probably all learned that that when we were still playing in the sandbox yeah, if, if one person tries to dig a hole uh, it takes a certain amount of time. If two people try to dig the same hole, it goes pretty much faster than before, pretty much twice as fast. But just imagine you had a sandbox and 500 people try to dig in the same hole. You can figure out that's not going to work because we're going to be in each other's way a month. And the question is, as with the sandbox or any other workload, 
is where's the point where adding more resources doesn't give you any point of return. And so what can, how can we scale? How can we do more work? Yeah. And there's four options. Option number one is we can take the existing work and try to optimize it, make it go faster, make it things. The second option is to reduce the work, figure out are we doing something that we don't need to do? Yeah. Example would be uh, pick up the shovel, uh, slam it into the ground, pick up some dirt, put it in uh, a wheelbarrow, put down the shovel. That would be a full working cycle. Uh, if you do the next shovel, you pick it up again. And if you do this 20 times, you probably figure out it's a stupid idea to put the shovel down every time. So keep the shovel in your hand and you just reduce the amount of work you have to do and you can finish faster. Yeah. Um, the next one is scale up, basically add more people or add faster people to do the job, better, better resources. And the other one is scale out. You add many, many, many resources and they don't have to be as good as the scale up. Of course, you can do the crazy thing and scale up and scale out at the same time. Yeah. Why not? Why not run a thousand machines with a thousand cores each? Yeah. Um, your financial officer will probably not agree, but it could be fun. Yeah. So optimize getting work done by doing the steps needed more efficient with the resources you have. Reduces, find just things you can skip and don't have to do. Yeah. Like in a data warehouse load, that could be an unnecessary verification if the data is correct or so. Don't worry if the moon. Don't remove the one you need, but other ones you can. Scale up, um, do it on a faster server that has a higher clock speed or has more cores in it. Yeah? Uh, do it in parallel on the same server. And then scale out, spread the work to many servers in parallel. That's great, but we will learn why only if done very, very correctly. So optimize. We have workload one, two, three, four. They're all the same size up to workload N. If we can optimize each one of them so that each portion goes faster, the overall work is done faster. Very simple. There's not much uh, that is, is a surprise there. Yeah? Uh, if I do 10 jobs and each one takes five minutes and now I can do them in four minutes, I will be finishing first uh, faster. Reduce. Uh, basically the same thing. I have n workload steps that I have to execute and I figure out every other one of them is actually unnecessary. So if instead of one, two, three, four, five, and so on, I can only do one, three, five, seven, uh, I will be done twice as fast as if I would have done all of them. Again, no surprise there. The problem is that in most cases, it's really hard to find, like, I'd be really doing 50% unnecessary work in some queries, maybe, but uh, it's it, it's not that easy. And usually you can do it like once, but then you are at the limit. Yeah. So scale up. What does this mean? We have our N workloads again. And what we're doing is we're doing them all in parallel because we figured out they're all independent from each other. Instead of digging one big hole, we actually need to dig four small holes and we can hire four different people and each one can do it by themselves. Yeah? So that's the same. We have to schedule the work. So in the beginning, we need a little bit of extra work to tell everybody what to do. And once everybody is done, we need a little bit of resources to figure out, hey, is everybody done? Because not every hole will be digged at the same speed. Uh, but overall, it takes about as long as one workload plus a little bit of overhead at the beginning at the end. So about one and a half workload times if you can do them all in perfect parallel. Yeah. And of course, that's theory. That's not what's happened. What's more practical is that these tasks depend at least a little bit on each other. So you can do like half of number one and then you can start number two and then again, number three and number four. So in the time you did number one, two, three before, you can now do one, two, three and four and you have a little bit extra time to start number five. Yeah? So that helps. Yeah? Even that helps. And 
a couple of slides in the future where we'll learn at which percentage of overlap this becomes not practical anymore. Scale out is basically the same as scale up, but with a little bit more overhead. So we have to spawn the workload now to other machines. So we have a network round trip to another machine telling that machine, hey, please do that for me. That other machine takes that task, gets it, executes it. Once it's done, it again uses the network to send the results back, which might be a lot of data if it's not efficient, or might be just a little bit. Yeah? Difference between uh, each one of the nodes can fully aggregate all the results we need because all the data that they need is on that node and they just send back the, the summary records. Or bad luck or bad query, and each and every node can just select the data, has to send it to the central node, and then the central node does all the work. Yeah? Um, best case, worst case scenario. But once it's all back, the results have to be collected, they have to be combined, and then we're done. Yeah? So instead of one and a half times of a single workload, this would probably take three, units, two and a half to three units of that same work. Yeah? But if we have a thousand, that's, and we can actually send them to a thousand different machines, it still only takes three. Same thing if they have dependency and you have the network between them, it's even worse than before. Don't have a drawing for that. So someone much smarter than me came up with this little formula, which probably has an explanation. P is the portion of execution that can be done independently, uh, basically independently. Yeah? So how much of the workload does? So 1%, 50%, 90%, how, how much independence can you have? Uh, and S is the speed up of the whole thing. So basically how many parallel engines to run stuff do you have? How many cores, how many resources do you have? How many servers? Yeah? This formula is the exact same for a single machine with many cores, as it is for a whole network scenario where you have hundreds of independent servers working on it. Yeah. Um, yes. So let's plot that formula out for a couple of things. So if let's start at the bottom, if 80% of our workload is independent, that means 20% depends on what the other nodes are doing. Uh, we're basically ending up in a flat line, as you can see at the bottom in the green area. So I might now flip around a little bit. Yes, here we go. Sorry. So this, there's the green one at the bottom. Um, after two or four, maybe eight CPUs, you have diminishing returns. Yeah? This, is, this is horrible programmed code that just doesn't care if other things need. Yeah? Only 80% can work independently. Yeah? You can make it worse, but... Uh, even that is yeah. So with uh, with four thousand cores, you would not see, you would barely see five times the performance of a single core. Yeah? So that's not. Yeah? But if we go from eighty percent to ninety five percent, we see that we basically start having diminishing returns at about thirty two cores. If we go to ninety six, ninety seven percent, ninety eight, the diminishing returns are somewhere in this area. Yeah, uh, at 200 cores. And 99, of course, we're going much more up and we might be able to scale like to a thousand nodes or a thousand cores. Yeah? After that, it's pretty much impossible. Yeah? You can try to get to 99.5% or so, but it's, it's, it's not, it's not going to happen. It's not easy. So let's apply that to SQL Server. Where is SQL Server on that percentage scale? Where, where SQL Server goes in. Um, and if we would be in a room, I would now take a poll with hands up where people think that SQL Server is. But since we're not, I have to reveal the answer immediately. So SQL Server is somewhere between 97 and 99% yeah? uh, on this efficiency independent stuff. Yeah? And that assumes reasonable queries. If you write a query where everything depends on everything else, Yes, the numbers are lower. But if you look at an average workload in reasonable software, this is where you end up. Yeah? Um, and why I picked 97 to 99 is it's, it's very simple. If you install, if you 
order a machine from a vendor um, and let them configure it and let them send it to you, you are at, you are here or at the bottom line. If you do a little bit of, hey, best practice, you get here. Yeah. If you do everything that's in this slide presentation and about three or four others I have, you might end up here. Yeah. So what does this mean in, in reality? Because this is a Zoom. I removed everything about 512 cores because right now that is very rare. Um, if you have somewhere between eight and 16 cores, it really does not matter. Yeah? Don't waste your time doing any kind of super optimizations or something. The gain is, is it is there, but it's not, it, it's not that, especially eight and below. Yeah? Uh, between eight and 16, so if you have 12, 16, 20, it starts making a difference. Yeah? If you have 32 cores, you're already making a lot of difference because if you have 25 times the speed of one CPU or 15 times, uh, that might already make a difference. At 64, it becomes even more extreme. We have between 20 and 40. So uh, do nothing and just install what someone tells you is good uh, that works in sales. Uh, you get the performance out of 20 cores or 20 times the speed of one core uh, when you have 64 instead of uh, almost uh, 40. Yeah? And that's where the big difference comes in. And this is where the, the hard part of the job comes in. And the bigger the machines get, yeah, 128 core machine is nothing special anymore. That's a two socket AMD, uh, costs less than $50,000. Yeah? And you uh, just plug it in, you have about 25 times the performance. You do a lot of uh, best practices, you get up to 55 to 60. Yeah. And when you get bigger, it's it's even it's even more. Yeah? When you look at the 512 mark at the end, between 30 times faster or 80 times faster, there's a big difference. Yeah? So if you have small boxes, don't waste your time. Waste it on optimizing queries. You have large boxes, spend some time making them really fast. So. Uh, let's do just a quick check if there are any questions so far. Uh, no questions yet. Everybody fell asleep. So, a long time ago in a server far, far away, <laughs> we had memory, we had a single core CPU, and we had I.O. Whatever the CPU wanted to do, the CPU could do at any point in time. Problem was, the CPU was the only thing that was working in these machines. And this is, we're talking 386, 486, uh, all these things um, that were there. Even the first generation of Pentium, I think Pentium 2 or 3 was the first one that actually added a second core. Yeah? So I will, that is a long time ago, and that was it. The nice thing was, whatever the CPU wanted to do at that moment, they just could do. Yeah. And that's what that's why I wanted them to start at a single core to explain that. The CPU needs to get memory, it just accesses the memory and immediately gets back what's in the memory back then. Back then the memory was actually compared to the CPU so fast that it actually happened in like one or two cycles. These days, if the CPU wants memory, it takes about 19 cycles. 19 CPU cycles to get data from memory. So memory is actually really slow compared to what a CPU could do if memory would be faster. You can build faster memory, but you can't pay for it. Um, <laughs> so once memory got larger and larger and with larger also slower compared to the original speed and CPU clocks went up crazy. These were the years, remember, when, when single clocks were where every month someone came out with a dot twice as fast clock speed, 100 megahertz, 200, 400, 600, 800, blah, blah, 2 gigahertz, 4 gigahertz, 5 gigahertz. Now we're back to 2. Um, thing is, so what 
the designers of the CPU figured out memory is becoming a bottleneck. So let's put some of the memory in something we call cache, which is basically memory, just faster. Um, and we layer it a little bit so it's more complex and people cannot understand how they relate to each other and we can hide uh, awesome performance in CPUs and then make people buy the next one. If we're still at zero cores, as at one core, so if it's in the L1 cache, they could get the data in the next cycle. If it was in L2 cache, it was usually two cycles, L3 cache, like five, six cycles, memory, seven, eight cycles at the time. Yeah, But again, the cache helped speed things up. It became really interesting and helpful, the cache, when they added a second core. So with two cores, you have one and then number two. They each, and that design hasn't changed till today. Every, every CPU on the planet still works that, that every CPU core has its own L1 and L2 cache. Yeah? And the second one also has its own. Yeah? Where they start sharing is in the L3 cache, which is also the device that they use to create something that is called cache coherence. Just imagine CPU zero, core zero loads something from memory and puts it in his cache and then writes to it. And then core one reads the same value from memory again um, and would get the old value. That would be bad. So one part of the cache is this between cores and between CPUs later, we'll talk about that, is to make sure that uh, if one CPU has an area of memory in its block, in its cache, that the other CPU or the other cores, when they want to try to access that, uh, pull it not from memory, but from the cache of the other core. Yeah. So that is, and that could be done with various implementations where the caches can directly talk to each other or where the cache first has to unload it into the L3 cache and then the other core can load it from the L3 cache. That depends on vendor, that depends on version of the CPU. Bottom line is they're figuring it out better and better. So this is one of the places where efficiency gets really bad. So a modern CPU that is on a single piece of silicon, yeah? they call it a die, uh, is pretty much looking like this. You have I think they still make some with four cores and six cores, but pretty much eight is the is the bottom of the of the stack. So I picked an eight one, and that's easy to draw. So we have our eight cores in in the middle somewhere, and then we have memory controllers on the CPU. We have the PCI Express controllers on the CPU, and we have something that we haven't talked about yet. Uh, it's called QPI links, which is if you have more than one CPU, you talk to the other CPU. This is when you talk about Intel. AMD makes it different. AMD has more PCI Express lanes, but if you have two CPUs, some of the PCI Express lanes are used to talk to the other CPU. So QPI is basically nothing else than a, a regular I.O. interface. It's just designed to just talk to another CPU. And AMD found a way to do that to the PCI Express bus. Both are about the same efficient. So we're waiting. The important thing here is, this is how an 8-core CPU looks like. And I'm going to switch to a 28-core CPU. And as you can see, while the number of cores went up massively in there, everything else that's connected to the CPU stays the same. And here's the little problem. In that 8-core CPUs, and you have 48 PCI I.O. lanes, it's pretty sure that each one of these eight cores gets whatever I.O. they need if, if, if spread nicely across all the storage devices. On a 28 core, there's a chance that the one it needs to go to right now is blocked. And with 12 memory slots, that's even more the chance that if you want a piece of memory right now, someone else is snooping around in the chip and you cannot get to it and have to wait. And this is why in these days, it takes up to 19 cycles for a CPU to get to memory. Yeah? Because memory is busy. 
because same as hardware vendors, we are not scaling everything the same. Look at a car. A car has a basic design of four wheels on the ground and then an engine. You can make the engine faster and faster, but if you're not changing the rest of the car, this car will fly off the road in every time it takes a turn. Yeah, this is why Formula One racing cars look very different than your regular minivan that you buy to get your kids to school. So this is the problem with CPUs, that an 8-core CPU uses the exact same outside resources than a 28 one. Good. So single CPU. Um, when should you use a single CPU? Low latency. And we will learn on the next slides why. And you can use them for generic servers. If you need smaller servers, perfect, one CPU. Yeah. So if you have the choice of buying two 10-core machines or one 20-core machine, the one 20-core machine will be faster, even if the clock speed is lower. And we will learn why on the, on the next slides. Yeah. So for low latency, if you need the fastest possible machine, you can never for a single thread to be as fast as possible, as, as computerly possible, not humanly possible, is you need a single CPU because the moment you have two of them, and the perfect machine would be a single CPU with one core, but you can't buy that anymore. But you can buy a four, a six, or an eight core and disable seven of them. And that actually makes it faster. So any questions? Uh, Every no time question so far. Cloud slide, we do this. Good. Hyperthreading. The big question, should I turn it on or off? And we will have an answer in one slide. So what is hyperthreading? A regular CPU has its arithmetic unique, floating point unique, memory management unique, all kinds of awesome stuff. Yeah? And then it has one thread state and one set of register and one set of flags. Yeah. And whatever needs to be done is done in that CPU. This is how CPUs were done for like 30 years. And then Intel had an idea and, or I don't know if it was Intel. Someone had an idea back in the days uh, to invent something called hyperthreading. And hyperthreading is you basically still have all the, the units that actually do the work just once but you have two sets of registers, two sets of flags, and two sets of uh, thread states. And that means you can run two hardware threads at the same time, and you can switch between them. Because there's a chance that thread A is going to use the arithmetic unit, and thread B is going to use the floating point unit, so they can do stuff at the same time. Uh, or thread A is waiting for memory, while thread B is computing something. Yeah? Uh, so they're not in their way. Yeah, sounds great, but it comes at a price. And the price is, if you look at hyperthreading from a single thread perspective, I am the thread, I want to run as fast as possible. The moment you turn hyperthreading on, I run about 30 to 40% slower. Because every time I want to do something, there is a one in three chance that the other thread is blocking me because it's using something I would need right now. I don't know, I want to shift some bits to the left. Ah, the other thread is doing this right now. I can't do it. Yeah. Um, and it's not just per instruction, it's 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 complete areas in the CPU they can only they can not share. Yeah. So if it's anything integer, one of them can do it. If it's anything floating point, the other one can do it at the same time. If both want to do something on integers, one has the weight. Yeah. So from a single perspective, you're 30 to 40 percent slower. So why would anybody ever turn it on? From an overall perspective, you're 20 to 40% faster. Yeah. So if you need to run two jobs and you turn hyperthreading on, on a, on a single core CPU, you are 40% faster overall. If you look at the time that a single task takes, you are 30 to 40% slower if you run them uh, one after the other. Yeah. So if you have independent stuff where it's important to have as much throughput as possible, 
hyperthreading makes sense. If you need quick response, hyperthreading is not good. Yeah. So in our trusty slide to compare the workloads. So hyperthreading on or off for low latency, definitely off. For high concurrency, definitely off. Uh, high throughput, definitely on. That's where it's it helps. Yeah. So in your data warehouse, turn it on. In your OLTP systems, turn it off. Uh, virtualization, turn it on. Uh, the more threads you have, the better this thing works. Uh, everything is about how much can I do at the same time in virtualization. So that's as good. As I promised, each time we reach one of these slides, I break for questions. Still no questions. Are you sure we're broadcasting? Ha, ha, ha. I'm, I'm beginning to question that myself. Oh. Okay, so far we've just worked with one CPU. Now we're going to add a second one. And the diagrams get funny. <laughs> so at the top we have one CPU, at the bottom we have one CPU. And to keep it simple, each one only has two cores. I think nobody ever built a machine like this. But, anyways. but as I said before, now we have the problem if we have to ensure cache coherence between the cores. So let's imagine we have some little information in this RAM here, and this core reads it. What happens is it gets transferred in the L3 cache, in the L2, into the L1, till it finally ends up into a register in that core. Now they modify it, which basically writes it in the modified version into this cache. Now, CPU number two needs a different piece of memory. Or, sorry, CPU number two wants to read the same thing. So this guy now wants to read this. So it asks his L1 cache, do you have it? L1 cache says, no. L2 cache says, do you have it? No. L3 cache says, do I have it? No. But I have to ask the other L3 cache from the other CPU because they might have. The other L3 cache says, yes, uh, I have it in my pipeline. Uh, one of the caches below me has the current value. Do you need it? Uh, and then the CPU says, yes, please. So the L3 cache makes the L1 cache, put it into the L2 cache. The L2 cache puts it in the L3, and then it goes here. Strangely enough, <laughs> That is still faster than getting it from memory. <laughs> but the problem is, if now let's say core number two wants a different piece of information. It asks the L1 cache doesn't have it, L2 cache doesn't have it, L3 cache doesn't have it. But instead of now just going to memory and pulling it from there, the L3 cache has to ask the other CPU, hey, do you have that? And the other CPU says, no, I don't. And then the L3 cache can say, okay, then I'll get it from memory. Yeah? And this extra asking adds a lot of time. And a lot is in, in uh, air quotes uh, to the whole process. Yeah. So a normal memory access on a single core CPU these days on an average sized memory module, there are faster ones, there are slower ones, but on, on the average, what you put into a server these days, it takes 76 nanoseconds to get uh, one cache line out of, of, of a memory module. Yeah? Uh, best case scenario, 98 worst case scenario yeah? for a single CPU. The moment you put a second CPU in it and the CPU, second CPU does nothing besides answering, I don't have that, I don't have that, I don't have that. So you're still running all your workload on the first one. Instead of uh, 76 to 90 nanoseconds, you're now at 139 to 140 nanoseconds. So almost uh, 2x of the best case scenario and about 40%, 60% uh, slower in the other one. Yeah? So adding a, a second CPU makes the whole thing a lot uh, slower when it comes to accessing memory. Yeah. So when when do you have to start being careful? 
and this is where the oranges and the slices of bananas mixed into the apples comes in. They are CPUs that trick you. They look like on the outside. So Intel, for example, has a 56 core CPU and you think, oh yeah, it's a 56 core CPU. I put that in my server and I don't pay penalty for, for the memory access every time. No, what you got is, so this, sorry, this would be two CPUs, 248 cores. So I know if I put this in 228 cores, every time this CPU needs something from memory, it has to ask the other CPU, do you have it? No, then I can get it. Yeah. If the other CPU already has it in their cache, I have to get it from the other side. So that's how two CPUs look like. And then there's this disguised one CPU, but implemented as two independent silicon chips. And for everybody that just saw the other picture, it looks like the same. The only difference is this little border around them too. From the outside, this looks like one CPU and is marketed as a 56 core CPU. In reality, it's two 28 core CPUs glued together. And glued is probably not even the wrong word. Um, it literally can do twice as much memory and has twice as much IO, but it's actually just a two socket server in one socket. Yeah? So they just figured out how to put it into one case, into one little chip holder uh, instead of two. Yeah? Um, and that is the problem. You think you have one CPU, but you pay all the price for two CPUs and not. Yeah? And this is where it gets tricky. There's another vendor that doesn't do 28 cores, but that does 64 cores. They do it a little bit different. Um, so if you buy the AMD 64 core chip, what you're actually buying is an eight socket machine <laughs> with a central memory controller. <laughs> so each one of these eight uh, CPUs, little CPUs on the die. And if, if they, they don't even hide it, they show pictures of their CPU where from the die where you can literally see eight little tiny things around one big thing. The one big is the memory and IO controller and the eight small ones are eight cores each in the worst, in the best one and less so. So if you buy a 32 core, you only have four of them. Um, and this is slightly different and this is where it's the, the sliced apple and the sliced orange. Yeah? In the first moment, you think, oh, we're paying the price for eight sockets instead of two. Yeah? So this, this must be way worse. These eight are not worse than two. Why? Because they have the memory controller in the middle. So if this L3 cache, if this thing needs to get something, it asks one. It doesn't have to ask all eight. It just asks the big chip in the middle. Uh, where, where is this? Give it to me from memory or give it to me from one of the other cores? It's your job to figure it out. And that memory controller in the middle keeps track of where stuff is. So while in the first moment it looks like worse when you look at how is this implemented, but in the end it turns out it's not actually that bad. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, um, and this is where it gets really tricky to compare. So is a two socket with 28 faster or an one socket with, thing? It's not easy, yeah? but bear with me and we get to four. So uh, it gets worse when you have these double CPUs um, that have two CPUs in one core uh, and you put four of them together, uh, two of them together, you get actually a four socket machine on two sockets. Uh, you get a lot of IO, you get a lot of memory, but what now happened is instead of three QPI links connecting the cores, suddenly between each one of the sockets, you only have one QPI link active. So suddenly the communication between the cores is down to one third to before. If we go back a couple of slides, we had three links between the two uh, groups of cores or two things. And now, uh, in this scenario, we just have one between each one of them. Yeah. 
So suddenly, if something is in memory over here and this core needs it, uh, the way to get it over there is through in here and then it can have it. Yeah. But instead of sending it through three pipelines in parallel, it now can only use one. And if this one is already busy and the next core here needs something from this memory chip, it has to wait for the first one to finish. Um, I'm not 100% sure, but I don't think that it can take like a, a detour and grab it this way. Uh, but it's uh, maybe a future optimization. But So this is where it gets can get really bad. Yeah. Um, I guess. So dual CPU, where to use it? Low latency, not anymore. High concurrency, nope, uh, still not there. Uh, high throughput, nope. Uh, but for generic servers, it's absolutely fine. It's, it's the workhorse. Um, and this is where the majority, I think it's 80 or 90% of all servers fall into this category of two socket. Uh, one or two use a couple of drives, a couple of network cards. Thanks. Okay, questions. No questions. Good. We four CPUs. Okay, the picture looks exactly like before, uh, where we had the two dual die CPUs, um, and that's exactly what Intel did. Uh, it took a four socket design and put it into two box and two chips and made it just thing. So four CPU looks exactly the same. Uh, for AMD, there is no four socket machine. AMD has never in their existence built anything that can do more than two sockets. Um, and they don't actually have to, because if you compare four times 28 is 112. Uh, versus two times 64 is 128. So currently AMD with a better design inside the chip for uh, memory access performance, better clock speed, better things uh, with less sockets uh, can do more horsepower than Intel with four. Uh, right now, uh, I, in my internal documentation have stated that Currently, it makes no sense to build any four socket machine. I can get to 128 cores, 256 threads with uh, a two socket machine, and I can't get to the same number with four. I'm, I'm slower. The only reason why I want to do that is if I need more IO. But AMD also with the dual socket machines put a wrench into that because uh, while technically this thing has more PCI Express lanes than a dual socket uh, AMD, the dual socket AMD PCI Express lanes are twice as fast. So technically AMD ends up with about twice as much IO as a four socket Intel AMD and two sockets. So where we are, Intel released a bunch of new CPUs a couple of weeks ago, officially. Uh, none of them can be used in a four so in a four socket machine. They're all only one or two sockets. Yeah? So Intel has not refreshed the high end uh, CPUs yet. Eight. Now it gets funny. <laughs> now it gets interesting. You remember that we had these little three connectors. If you want to connect eight objects and each one only has three connectors, you can't do it because you have eight objects and you would need seven connectors on each one of them to talk to all the other ones so you don't have that so to overcome that this funny little diagram here shows how you connect eight of them and uh for people that have really good 3d imagining skills what that is is a cube where one thing is flipped 180 degrees one side. Uh, <laughs> if, if you have fun, you can try to just draw this as, an, as, a, as a regular 3D cube, and then you see how the lines go. It's basically you take a cube and you turn half of it around. It's like when you like 
wind a, a, a towel, uh, but just instead of a towel, you take a, a cube. So how this works is that every time every CPU is connected to three other CPUs directly. And if we compare that to our four, sorry, uh, let me move on that, sorry. Mm -hmm. If we if we look at our four socket design that we had before, each one was connected to three others directly, and that is still the case. So, for example, CPU six is directly connected to number two, seven, and five. So, what happens if six needs to go to CPU number one? Yeah, it could go to six and ask seven, "Hey, do you know anything about number one? No. Let's go to number four. No." Let's go to number zero and then go down to number one. Yeah, that's not how it's doing it. Every CPU has a path to any other CPU with exactly one extra hop. So for six to get to one, six would go from six to five and then to one. To get to four, it would it can either go to seven and four or five and four. Yeah? Uh, to get to number three, it would go to number two and then down to three. Yeah. Uh, so with this design, each and every CPU can reach every other one. And this is why the middle one has to be crossed out. If you don't have the middle one crossed out, you can't have that. Uh, you basically, you need a shortcut to the other side of the cube. Um, and that's why the, the twist is in the middle. Yeah. So eight sockets things. Yeah? With eight sockets, meaning that you always have double hop CPUs, your memory access gets even slower. Yeah, but you're gaining a lot of cores, and if you can keep your workload independent from and that they don't share need data from the other CPUs a lot, um, it uh, it still works pretty well. So what's above thirty two eight cores? Uh, eight sockets. Above eight sockets, you can't directly connect CPUs anymore. Above eight, oops. Sorry, I had some text I was not aware of. Uh, so you have now three levels of latency. We talked about that. And the bandwidth of CPUs is down to one third of a dual socket. Yeah, that's what it is, even down to one sixth due to possible sharing of a link to a remote via hop access. Yep. So, yep, that's what it is. The more CPUs you have, the more you must ensure that they find the data they need locally yeah? and just have to do the snoop where they don't have to actually move data, where they just ask the other CPU, do you have this data right now? No, good. I can use it. Yeah. Um, so, what do you do when you go above it? Let's go from 8 to 32 because 16 and 32 are exactly the same design, just half of it. Yeah. So why not immediately go to 32? So careful, it's a little bit <laughs> overwhelming in the first moment. But the way you do anything above eight is you build four socket machines and then you connect them with a magic. You connect them with magic. Yeah, uh, it's, it's an ASIC that to my knowledge, only HP has developed one. It's the only company that currently gives you more than eight, but I might be wrong there. Uh, thing is, so what they do is they basically say we take, and if we remember the design from the eight again, yeah, so the design from the eight was we have two fours that are connected in a square, and then we have top and the bottom and the cross in the middle. Yeah. So what they basically did is they took that, they took half of that eight design and then instead of connecting it directly to another half, they said, we have two special chips here and we connect every core, uh, every socket with the third connector they have directly to that chip. So if they want to talk within the four, they go between themselves and they share data between them. Yeah. Uh, if they need anything else, they ask the special chip and that special chip keeps track of what's going on in the rest of the box. 
Yeah. So if CPU number nine needs to talk to number 11, it's very simple. They go directly. If nine needs to talk to number 10, it will either go through eight or through 11 and talk to it. Yeah. If this guy, number nine, needs to talk to, let's say, 21, it understands that's not one of my neighbors. So I jump on the highway, that special chip, and that special chip has a direct link somewhere over there from here to the other one. And then it can ask this one directly. So same as before, you have one extra hop before you at the other CPU because these two chips are not, they do nothing else but transport data. So they, they, they count as just one extra hop. Yeah? And this is how they scale to 32 and theoretically any other number. Right now, there's no chipset that has more than the capability of connect more than 32 CPUs. Um, but this, this is how the high-end version works. And that actually scales pretty good. So you pay a lot of price if you go from, right now, if you have two, that's the most, one and two is the most efficient you can do. One, you get the highest, the lowest latency. Two, you get the most out of one box for a reasonable amount of money. Four, makes no sense whatsoever right now. Eight has a use case. If you need a lot of parallel threads working on independent data that occasionally needs to share something like a database, it's really good um, thing is. And the nice thing is eight, 16 and 32, the overhead for the CPUs talking to each other doesn't get higher, mostly because of this design so that they can all talk to each other directly through that extra layer of uh, chipset. Yeah? Um, it's basically what the chips, they, what, what computers did 10 years ago before they were connected directly to CPUs, you had a crossbar and that's what's in these large machines just back in there. Yeah? So that's the 32. Let me clean up because I'm pretty sure I put some text here. Um, yep, not much worse <laughs> than eight CPUs. And that's the important part. From eight to 32, it's not bad. With four CPU, node same as eight socket and node to node communication to each CPU. Yeah. It's a little bit more than if they would be direct connected, but it's you almost can forget it. Yeah. So to support all these separations, we have to talk new about. So for eight and more CPUs, low latency, definitely not. Uh, high concurrency, yes, this is where it kicks in. Can I, because I need thousands of threads to run, that means I need thousands of cores that do something. Yeah? Uh, if I have 10, 15, 20,000 connections going into SQL Server, I can give them the fastest 16 or 64 core chip. It cannot deal with it. Uh, and we've all seen that it's that whoever has ever uh, had to deal with, uh, it's called uh, worker thread exhaustion, that you don't have enough worker threads because it, there's a limit how many you can create per CPU reasonably. Uh, but if you have a 32 socket with 28 cores each, uh, you already have 800 something uh, cores to begin with. You turn hyper threading on, you double that uh, and suddenly uh, you can have five, 10,000 worker threads that take requests and queue them up. Um, and that's much better than the seven, 800 that you have on your typical two CPU box. You can use that for high end data warehouses. Uh, I'm, I recently did a little bit of experimenting with the 32 socket box. We connected a lot of hard drives. And we could do table scans at about 800 gigabytes per second. That's a terabyte every one and a half seconds. Uh, <laughs> so um, that's basically your DVD library uh, read in 10, 15 seconds. Um, 
Um, I don't know how fast you could watch Netflix uh, in, in one go from that, but uh, I'm pretty sure uh, you could watch a couple of uh, long um, movies plus hundreds of series at the same time and would not run out. Yep. So this, this is where these machines come really in. Yep. Um, generic workload? No, don't never ever go above two. It's, it's not worth the, the hassle, even for virtualization. I've seen people do four socket machines for VMs. Um, in my opinion, that's waste of money. Are you better off with two, two sockets availability wise? And, uh, you can form factor wise, it's, it's just better. So, ah, oh, sorry. Any questions? Uh, didn't have a question, although Anders did mention that uh, this makes a lot more sense the second time that he's seen the presentation. <laughs> Actually, no, we do have a question. All right. So do any of these physical layout variations affect SQL Server licensing costs? Likewise, yeah. would disabling cores on a CPU reduce what needs to be licensed? <laughs> so two-part question, two-part answer. Answer number one, it doesn't matter how you lay it out it does not change the licensing cost except for one thing. Let me get to some white space here. So the only different way you have licensing difference based on cores and hyperthreading. Yeah? If you have a, a physical box that has N number of cores, yeah, doesn't matter. X, let's make that X cores. Yeah? X number of cores, you pay X half license packs. Yeah? with physical if you disable half of them it depends i'll get to that after explaining the first one if you have a physical box with x cores plus hyper threading you pay x half licensing so hyper threading on off no difference for licensing and here's where the difference come in if you take the physical boxes and license them completely and then run vms on top of them you are still in that licensing model. But if you have one with hyperthreading and you don't license the, the host, but you license the individual uh, VM, then you pay uh, cores plus hyperthreads divided by two, but only for these VMs, yeah, if you des decide. And this is why some clouds are so expensive because the cloud gives you always hyperthreading. It's almost impossible to get machines without hyperthreading and they license you per VM. So you pay double the licensing for only about 20 to 40% more performance. Um, one of the many things people take not into account when moving there. So that's that part. The question for if I disable license uh, course. Yeah. So that's sorry. It takes a while to clean. So, um, officially from Microsoft, the statement is you can disable cores through a hypervisor. So, what does this mean? You have the box, and let's say for for easy bookkeeping, we say we have sixty four cores here. That would mean divide by two is thirty two core packs. I would pay. Yeah. If I now put a hypervisor on top of it and give I run only one VM on it, and that one VM just uses 32 cores, uh, I pay, and I don't license the physical box, I would pay 32 divided by two is 16 core packs. This is the official way. So what if my main board has the option that I run the same box, the same 64 core box, but I, in, I go into my bias, and say disable, turn off 32. So suddenly this shows 32 cores and Windows starts and only sees 32 cores. Yeah. When you go for, when you talk to any salesperson at Microsoft, what they tell you, your licensing cost is 64 divided by two because that's the number of cores that's in the machine. So you're paying 32 license packs. And then now a tip. And if any Microsoft salesperson is on the call, I'm sorry. What you do is you ask 
that this information be given to you in writing. And the moment you have it in writing, signed by a person who can legally sign documents at Microsoft, you're going to only pay 16 core licenses. Um, you will never hear from them again. And everything's fine. They don't want to go to court to figure out if it's true or not. A third really funny option, you can talk to a hacker who can disassemble your BIOS and rename the word BIOS to hypervisor, then you technically have disabled it in a hypervisor. Uh, I hope someone is laughing. It's so annoying when you talk to a monitor and it's doing nothing when you tell a joke. Um, <laughs> uh, in theory. Yeah? So that's the answer about the licensing. It's annoying. Um, in every company I worked in the past, we disabled cores to get the clock speed of the CPUs up and to have more cash for the remaining cores when we didn't need them. And till this day, I do not know that Microsoft answered any of them in writing that this is actually not allowed to do. If you just ask them for verbal confirmation, they all give it to you. If you ask in writing, I've never seen anybody and I've talked to many other people that ask the same question. Anybody has ever gotten it in writing? And this is not a discussion point. So officially, based on, there is no written information how to deal with disabling cores on the CPU BIOS main board level. Yeah? Uh, if you talk to them, they tell you, you cannot do it. Or if you do it, you still have to pay the full licensing. You want that in writing? They will never bug you again. Yeah. Officially, I cannot uh, endorse you to do that, but I cannot stop you from doing it. So moving on, <laughs> unless there's other questions. Yep, those were the questions. Cool. So I know at least one person is still listening. Good. <laughs> so. Numa, non-uniform non -uniform memory access. Um, as we learned before, when you have multiple CPUs, multiple cores, memory access between them is bad. So around SQL 2000, Service Pack 3, Service Pack 4 fully, uh, Microsoft started to embrace Numa in machines. Yeah? So if you had SQL Server Service Pack 3, it was running much slower than SQL Server Service Pack 4 on a, a back then four socket, four core machine. <laughs> High end. <laughs> uh, no, actually they had 16 socket machines at the time, but uh, this was thing is today your laptop has more. It's hilarious. Um, so when you have one CPU connected to memory and connected to IO, uh, you don't have NUMA because everything is uniform. Everything is the same thing. We're basically back to the very first slide where I showed you one CPU, one core. Thing is, yeah? So if you have all your data in that memory on that drives, uh, that's what you can do. So if you add a second core and uh, more memory uh, on the second CPU, uh, you can and keep going, uh, then if you're not trying to separate the data between the CPUs, you will have lots of cross access. And this is where you get from the 99 to the 97%. It's not, it, it's not like that it, it's completely blocking SQL Server. Once the data is exchanged between the CPUs, SQL Server has to do a lot of work independently. But just a little bit overhead of constantly asking the other CPU for the right memory uh creates this difference between 97 and 99 percent yeah uh of of how much uh concurrency is possible yeah but you've seen when you have eight eight cores or less it doesn't matter if you have 256 or more it's two to three times more power you get out of the same machine by doing exactly what i'm explaining in the next couple of minutes so instead of having one big table here, you might want to partition or create separate small tables. Yeah? 
And then what you do on your client, when your client comes in, and in this case, it's very eight. So when your client wants to connect and load, for example, data from customer number 80, nah, too complex, customer number seven, yeah? Uh, instead of, well, I'm not actually following my own example, customer number three, <laughs> because one, two, three. Uh, if you're coming in as customer, you want data from customer number three, you come in and you have on your, uh, instead of having uh, one network card and one IP address, you give SQL Server eight network cards and eight IP addresses. And then you create in your application eight different connections to SQL Server, each one using a different name and IP address, therefore connecting to the other one. If I now know I want to connect to customer number three, it's stored uh, in the NUMA node number three, because we just run it through. So number three would here, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and then customer number 11 would be on the same interface again. So three, 11, and so on, yeah? Uh, 17, nah, 19, um, and so on, yep. Yeah? These customers would be here. Um, and that's the simplest form of load balancing. You basically, you take your custom ID, you modulo it by eight and between zero and seven, that's the interface you're going to. Yeah? Um, and if all of your applications do that and every time and all the access to your application or that the majority of the access to the application is through, you know, a customer because you're doing something for a customer, which when you do business, it's very likely. Yeah. Um, Every time you do something for the customer, you connect to the network card that most likely is connected to the CPU that most likely has that customer data in its memory. Yeah. Um, and then you go in here and you can directly get it and you're done. And if you're customer six, you go to interface number six and so on. Yeah. Uh, a little bit of code in your application makes a whole lot of a difference. Why? Because yes, you will still have, if you need to sum up your daily revenue across all customers, you still have to go across all the nodes. But again, the majority of the workload during the day is probably based on customer or item or trade symbol or something else, whatever is in your business. Yeah? If you can spread that across multiple nodes and ask the most likely node, you can compare that to human example. You have uh, eight offices um, and um, eight people that work in them, and each one of them processes files. So you have a file. If you know to which one of the eight to go that is responsible for your file, you go into the right office, you put it on the desk, there's a chance they immediately help you and send you back. If you bring it to the wrong office, the guy is going to say, yeah, I'll take it. And then when he's not busy, he's going to hand it over uh, to the other uh, guy uh, to get the data from him, give him a phone call, ask him about all the stuff, and then processes your file, which takes much longer. And exactly the same happens if you don't embrace Numa. SQL internally is still doing a hell lot of an optimization. And this is why SQL is at, is at 97, even if you don't do anything. The question is, can I get from 97 to 99% efficiency? Uh, when talking to my SQL server. Yeah? And again, you have a small box, it doesn't matter. But in the large boxes, it matters a lot. Soft NUMA. We unfortunately no longer have single core CPUs, but every CPU has only one IO a bus, so we can only put one network card there. But we have still more, ca uh, more cores and caches. Uh, so we could, within a CPU, split it up even more uh, and, for example, give the one network card that is connected to, let's say, a 16-core CPU, we could give that one network card not just one IP address, we could give it 16 IP addresses and do this to all of the eight network cards. Um, and then we would have... Uh, 
128 IP addresses on the box. And now we can split up the customers, not between eight buckets, but now we can split up the customer between 128 buckets, even better. Yeah? And same thing as before, you come in, if you come in by the right guy, it goes right through to the data. Everything's most likely in cache already and you get your answer quickly. Yeah? If you ask this guy for data over here, it's still gonna go, go efficiently. If you ask this guy for data from another CPU, you have to go all the way here to the memory and to the other CPU. Yeah? So this is, this is the difference what you can do. Yeah? Embracing NUMA, let's say gets you from 97 to 98. Embracing soft NUMA gets you to 98.5. <laughs> you still have to do more to get to 99. Um, things. Super and sub latches, something you probably never have heard of. We all have heard about latches and latch weights and, and all these things, but what are super and sub latches? The reason you not have heard about them is because they only show up on machines with more than 64 cores and they are still rare. Uh, what happens is um, with many NUMA nodes and cores, yeah? if you actually only have two NUMA nodes, they're not creating a super latch because it doesn't help actually. Yeah? It helps when you have a lot of them. Yeah? What super ledges are is they duplicate very active pages in memory to every NUMA node. So let me draw this before. I yeah? So imagine your typical table, thousands of pages and your awesome index tree on top of it that then has intermediate pages and then somewhere the root page for the, the root index page. Every time someone has to access that table, they go through the clustered index to find the, the, the row they want to find. They have to go through that root page. Doesn't matter where else the data ends up, every request goes through this. So if this is a table that is accessed from multiple CPUs or multiple cores, uh, on, from multiple NUMA nodes across the machine, and this is where I said SQL does stuff to make it better for you. What they say is, instead of having that page once, we have that page multiple times. So if this CPU needs access, it goes to this copy. If the other CPU needs access, it goes to this copy. And then there's a chance Below the root page, you have probably 32, 64 uh, intermediate pages uh, that the CPU ends up on a different page than this one. So they don't disturb each other, but they would have disturbed each other on the root page. And even if they're only reading, uh, then they, there needs still to be control access on a page. Yeah? And there's awesome talks from um, Bob Ward on, super, on, on ledges. Yeah? So that's a, that's the gain when you have. Why are they only doing it for the top for the root pages and not for other pages as well that are hot or often used? The problem is you should only do this for data that is read almost read only because the problem now is to write to a page you need a much higher ledge. You need not you need an exclusive ledge, but since it's now multiple copies of that you not just need an exclusive ledge on this page, you also need an exclusive page he ledge here, an exclusive one here, an exclusive one here. Once you've got all four exclusive ones, then you can make your change four times, uh, and then you can release the ledge from all four pages again. And if you have 32 NUMA nodes, you need to get 32 copies, and you need to get 32 ledges. Yeah? So that's the reason this is not, this is only done for pages where it's very, very, very unlikely that they change. The root page in a big table, uh, not changing more than like once a month or so, not a big deal. Yeah? If this is something that changes every five minutes, they will not make it the super ledge. It's not worth the effort. Yeah? But this is one of the awesome things they built in a long time ago. This was, by the way, in SQL to uh, in 2005. <laughs> it's just that at that time, nobody had a machine that it would show up except a couple people on the planet. So um, duplicates every active page 
for reads, there's already a local copy in your local memory. Uh, and you're, you're actually asking uh, the local copy. So there is just a snoop to the other CPUs and they all tell him immediately, no, nope, not in our cache. Yeah. So right, large and all copies is required. We talked about that. So actively support NUMA. Low latency, yes. Why? You only have one connection. It's easy. Just go with it. <laughs> High concurrency, yes, definitely. That's where it's made for. High throughput or generic servers, no, don't bother. The generic one, it's not worth the effort. Uh, and for high throughput, you're not gaining because you have so little concurrent requests. Uh, there's no point in splicing them out. And most of the time, you're going to scan across all the data. So you're not having any benefits. It's basically for cases where you have small amounts of memory, small amounts of data, and you're changing them frequently uh, and often. So as it's the four color slide, questions? Yeah. Uh, so we do have a question. Can we do the um, splits, the customer split with partitioning, or do we need to do this with application code when you're talking about NUMA? No, you could do it with partitions and then have, have, have the partition key being the same as your, uh, use the same partition key in your application and down there. That, that's actually, uh, so you still have to do something in the application. You can't do it without changing the application. If you just partition it, you gain a little bit, but your application will randomly come in. Your application has no idea where to come in. So you, you have to teach the application how to use these eight, in our example, eight, or in, in your example, four or 32 separate connections. Yeah. Uh, if you don't do that, you're not, you're not helping. Yeah. So uh, the, the, it, you can do the, the SQL part with partitioning to ensure that the data is separated and have each partition basically on a preferred node. Uh, which you could even embrace by putting the partitions in different file groups, have the different file groups files that would be on hard drives that are connected directly to that CPU, making it even easier to load it in. Um, so that's where you can use partitioning great, uh, but you still have to change the application. I know for most database teams, that's a no-go because if they ask the application team to change anything, uh, it's not. Um, there's a recording of that session somewhere on YouTube. Uh, <laughs> pick that little piece and show it to your manager uh, if it doesn't believe you. Uh, and then maybe suddenly uh, they figure it out. And I would pick the part at the beginning where if we don't do it, we are at 97. If we do it, we're at 99. We're twice as fast on a big box. Again, if you have a generic small server, all this is not relevant. Other questions? Uh, no other questions. Good. Moving on. CPU affinity. Everybody is waiting for that one. <laughs> um, so what do we have? We have cores. We have schedulers. They run up there. We have queries, worker threads, and all that. Yep. Um, and What happens is that the worker thread can switch between cores eventually. So you run a while on this one, then you run a while on this one, then you run on this one again. Yeah. And every time you switch scheduler, you air you the chance is that you will not be near the data you just put in the cache of that core. So that's bad. Yeah. The problem on the other hand is if you stick on one core. So this is the default option. This is how SQL comes out of the box. Uh, I put a screenshot here. And the thing that gives it away is that none of these is selected. Yeah, They're all empty. That means, and it says up here, automatically process affinity mask for all processors. So let SQL decide what's best. And again, for average workload, this is the best option. Yeah. You don't have to worry. Yeah. Uh, if you set them all to one, you're changing the behavior. Uh, 
you can do this with these little commands, auto server configuration process affinity CPU equals auto, sets it back to this. So this makes it this. Um, and if you list, if you would write zero to, uh, let's say we have a 64 core machine, six zero to 63, uh, that would be this version. Yeah. Uh, and the other ones I just gave you, you can uh, affinitize just uh, a couple of CPU cores if you want. And thing is, that's the variation I use it to, if I have multiple instances on a box, I use this to give certain instances certain cores and then have some overlapping ones uh, to ensure uh, they, they're not taking up all the resources. Uh, so I'm basically building my own little resource coming up. So if you set that all to true, thing is, auto means you can migrate between all schedulers. Affinity set, only use the scheduler and stay on it from start to finish. The problem with that is, let's assume you're doing an, you're doing eight, you do, sorry. Let's assume we have four cores and you're doing four medium sized workloads. Sorry, no, three medium sized workloads. One, two, three, and four. Three medium, and then a big one comes in. Yeah. And then another big one comes in. And now SQL Server has the all four CPUs are busy at the time because none of them is done. So SQL Server randomly picks one for the next uh, job. And it could pick this one because it doesn't know how high the arrow is. Yeah? It picks this one again and runs a second one on this one. So if you now have affinitized the CPUs, these three finish, but these two have to stick on that one core and fight it out. While if you have the other method, one of them would migrate away and then would never come back. Yeah? So this is where it gets in tricky. Yeah? You have to make the choices. If you have large and small queries, you should never affinitize CPUs because that is way too likely to happen. If you just have very tiny queries that all finish very quickly and it makes more work to move them between them, then, then you should affinitize. Yeah? Yes. If you set affinity plus you set trace flake 8002, you are basically telling this instance of SQL Server only use these cores and then you tell the other instance to use the other cores. Um, but within the course, within this area, it can still move again. Yeah. So this would be the case. Instead of four CPUs, you have eight and you're telling this is instance number two. This goes to instance number one, but we're setting trace flake 8002 on both of them. So now the workload can balance between the cores again. So unless you really know what you're doing, don't do the middle one. If you really know what you're doing, do the middle one. Uh, other than that, just do the other two. Yeah, uh, That's much more when you don't micromanage each and every query. Uh, it's much more likely that you will be have a happy day with that. Uh, the overall um, recommendation, if you ask Microsoft, they tell you not to play with Affinity because you really need to understand what's going on. Yeah, But to get from the 97.5 to the 97.8, uh, sorry, from the 98.5 to the 98.8, uh, you need to affinitize. Yeah? Uh, because the wobbling between the schedulers uh, is, is taking too long. So when should you set affinity? Low latency, definitely. Don't even bother moving between cores because we're only using one of them. Uh, high concurrent OLTP? Yes, definitely. Small workloads, thousands of them. Don't waste your time moving them between CPUs. Um, all the other cases, no, definitely not on a generic server. And again, in a high throughput data warehouse, 
unless you need to manage multiple instances, stay away from it. Yeah. We are on a four color slide. Any questions? No questions at the moment. Okay. Every brain has exploded by now. Scaling IO as well. So this is very brief because there will be an in-depth talk like this just for IO. Um, whenever the next big conference asks me to do it. I've submitted it to three or four of them, so there's a big high chance some will pick it. So there's a chance for next year to have that one. But I give you a little preview because the problem is that in many, many cases, scale up is done in the wrong way. So what that means is you have your 1x server in some size. It doesn't matter how big it is. It's just, let's call it 1x. So if you have 1x CPU, 1x memory, 1x network. And then they most likely connected to a SAN, which we, you should not do these days anymore, but that's a story for another day. So you have 1x on IO, 1x on capacity, and 1x on latency. So you have six times a baseline of 1x. Yeah? And then you want to go, so you have these six individual baselines, and you divide it by six, and you end up an overall of a baseline of 1x. This is what you want. So the goal now is to go to 8x. Yeah, what most people do is instead of having, let's say, four cores, they go to uh, four times eight, 32 cores. And if the DBA is lucky, they give him like four times as much memory. They definitely not give him an extra mem uh, network card. Why would we do that? Um, and then we give them bigger disks. Uh, if he gets super lucky, we give him an extra IO path a second net, uh, storage card. But again, this is also many cases I've seen not. But the capacity of the drives, we give them eight times the, 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 the storage. And the latency to the drives is, of course, the exact same as before. So um, why is this machine not going eight times as fast as the original one? We gave him eight times the CPUs. Why is it not eight times faster? Yeah, if you do this like elementary school math again, uh, you have 8x, 4x, 1x, 2x, 8x, 1x, and if you add that all up and you divide it by 6, you only get 4x on average. So depending where your actual bottleneck is, you will be somewhere between 1 and not fast at all. So if your bottleneck, for example, is latency, nothing was done to change the latency, you will still be exactly as fast as before. If your bottleneck was network, you still have the same bottleneck. If your bottleneck was memory, now you have four times as much, you will be better off. If your bottleneck was actually CPU, you might see increase there. So that's done the wrong way. Don't stop doing this. It's so hard. And you have no idea how many hours of my life I've wasted explaining that to people. Not that it's a waste today, because you will spread the word more, so it's better. But CFOs, CTOs, CEOs, that just don't understand it because these little guys that sell these boxes here, yeah, these little thingies, expensive malfunctioning components, uh, they have so much marketing money and they spread so many apples disguised as oranges, you have no idea. So how do it correctly? We throw this away uh, and let's have a look at the storage pyramid. So the fastest storage you can have is the CPU register. It takes about 0.1 nanoseconds to access it, or one clock cycle. Uh, you have CPU caches that take between 5 nanoseconds and 4 nan uh, 0 0.5 and 4 nanoseconds. Then you have memory, deep RAM, DRAM, uh, 9 to 20 nanoseconds. Um, persistent memory, NVDIMMs, uh, about 1 microsecond. No longer nanoseconds, we're now microseconds. And remember here, this is uh, already 50 times slower suddenly. So we have uh, from here to here, we have 20x slower. Here we have another 50x, and then it gets way worse down the pyramid. After that, we have solid state devices like NVMe and PCI Express devices that are between 2 and 10 microseconds access time. We have solid state disks the regular SSDs that have still SATA inter interfaces, SAS interfaces, they're between 10 and 100 microseconds. 
Um, then we have storage area networks where we have to change the unit again. Uh, so they have between 0 0.2 and 10 milliseconds. Uh, 100 microseconds, 10 milliseconds. That's a 100x difference between SAN and a stupid drive. If you take another good drive, that's about a thousand times faster. This is where you should be today. This is what you should be using when it comes to storage. This is because you have it, throw this thing out. Half of the problems I see with SQL Server are caused because people use a storage technology that is now 30 to 40 years old and it hasn't improved. It's just something, it was the same thing with spinning hard drives. Spinning hard drives were great, but between they were when they were invented and when they became obsolete, which they are these days, uh, they improved in capacity thousands and thousands of times over. But in performance, they got not much faster. Yeah, the, the very first drives were in the 20 megabytes, and the very last drives were in the 200 megabytes. So but the first drives were 40 megabytes in size, and the last drives were uh, in the 20 terabytes in size. And you got 10 times as fast, but nothing. Yeah? And then at the bottom, of course, you have tape, and then you have printed paper with people and typewriters. Yeah? Um, but that's a storage permit. Yes, yeah? And yes, yeah? the cost, of course, goes up. but if you factor cost only as how much it costs you the storage or how fast it runs your business, because if you need only half the servers because your storage is twice as fast and you're paying 50% more for the storage, you're actually saving money. Good storage options, NVMe disks, yeah? uh, PCI Express cards, yeah? the little cards thing is, NVDIMMs, these are little memory chips with batteries glued to them. Um, and persistent memory, that's the latest thing. It's basically a memory chip that doesn't forget what's stored on it. Yeah, This is what a modern machine should be using. 99% of the machines this, 1% uh, might have to go here. Yeah, uh, th This is how storage is scaled these days because uh, I'm, I refuse to work on optimizing paths and, and storage cards when thing is, yeah? Latency is measured in microseconds and nanoseconds. Yeah? One petabyte is about 70 minutes. You can process a petabyte on this storage in 70 minutes. Uh, most SANs have a problem that it takes you to restore that long to restore like one or two terabytes. Yeah? Faster ones, you might be able to do 10 or 20. Yeah? Uh, really fast ones, you might be able to do 100 in that time frame. Yeah? The petabyte, again, 10 to 100 times faster, just by thing is. And they are cheaper. Yeah? Uh, in that, that's on these. Uh, persistent memory, you can do about 24 terabytes in about 300 seconds. Uh, so that's really, really nice and fast. And NVDIM, you can do about 1.5 terabytes in about three seconds. Um, and the reason I gave these smaller numbers is because there's a physical limit how much you can connect. Yeah, So you can only have 24 terabytes of N N N NVDIM. Right now, you can only have 1.5 terabytes of, uh, sorry, 1.5 terabytes of NVDIM, 24 terabytes of PMEM, and about one petabyte of NVMe drives. After that, the cables cannot be long enough to connect them all. It's it's literally a physical problem. Um, you can do more than a petabyte on, on a 32 socket because the machines are spread more, uh, but you're tapping out. Practically, I've done theoretical things that you can do about 10 petabytes. Uh, but the funny part is it would still only take 70 minutes because this is how you actually scale. So low latency server. We said we had one CPU, a uh, couple of cores, and we have 48 PCI Express lanes and 12 memory things. Or if you have AMD, you have 128 PCI Express lanes and 
um, 16 memory slots. You split that up into four X NVMe drives and you put the network card on the remaining eight X. That gives you uh, one CPU, lots of memory, uh, about 1.5 terabytes in reasonably priced, three terabytes in expensive memory, um, and then uh, a total of 10 uh, NVMe drives. They can, the larger, the, the best price factor right now is about eight terabytes, but there's the first 16 terabytes on the market. With 16 terabytes, you can put about 120 terabytes on a single CPU box and read it as fast as you can dream of. And, and then you have one network card plugged in here, should have two connections and there you go to two redundant switches. There's no point in having a second network card. It's most likely not gonna fail. If you take one for low latency, you take one of the memory chips out and you put one of the ones with the battery in, you just made your write speed um, a thousand times faster, something like this. Uh, why? Because Microsoft doesn't have to commit the log to the NVMe drive anymore. It commits it to the battery chip. Uh, and if you lose power, it comes back, it finds the data still in the, in the log buffer uh, and will finish the write. Um, works beautifully. If the machine dies, you can take that chip with the battery, and that's why the battery is glued to the memory chip, carry it over to your DR machine, plug it in there, switch it on, and SQL Server finishes the transaction it committed into that thing. Um, when you do it in your test lab, you are close to a heart attack. I don't want to do this in a production environment, but uh, it should be possible. Um, is commodity server mixed workload. So that's the two socket Intel AMD. Uh, basically looks like the previous machine just twice. Uh, and that's the trick. Yeah? You have higher latency, uh, but therefore you can have twice the memory, twice the disk and twice the CPU. Yeah? So up to 128 cores and four terabytes on, on AMD and six terabytes, but only 112 cores on Intel. Yeah? and about 120 terabytes usable storage. Two CPUs, twice the memory, uh, and twice the drives, and twice the network cards. Put in everything twice. Why? We have two NUMA nodes. We want to use them as independently as we can. If you connect the network card to one CPU and the disks to the other CPU, every time you do a network I.O. or every time you do a disk I.O., the other CPU has to be bothered. If you split it half and half, there's a big chance it's on the local one. If you actually do some uh, supporting NUMA, it's gonna be there. But again, I said on the two socket, don't bother with it. But on the bigger ones, it gets there. Balance the system resources between CPUs. If two CPUs put half the memory, half the drives, half the network cards on one of each one. That's a simple thing is open up the box and charge, start shuffling things around. Why? Because most vendors deliver it like this. Why? Because it runs slower. You already paid for it. Why, why give you a fast machine? I can, in the benchmark, they do it, in, they do it like this. Yeah? And when they sell it to you, they do it like this. Yeah. So why? You paid for it. So if it now doesn't run as fast as advertised, we can always make it that fast. Oh, yeah, it's just configured wrong. You did the mistake. But in reality, you will buy the next machine about a year or two earlier than when you balance it out. So don't do that. I've even seen crazy ones where they put all the memory on one CPU and didn't give the other CPU even memory. Uh, but they did it so cleverly that the OS was running on that CPU. Uh, so really like they, they deliberately configured it the worst way possible. Yeah. Uh, so that one, definitely a no go. Yeah. Should not even exist. That's how bad it is. Uh, but unfortunately it's when you just buy it from a vendor and don't kick their ass, uh, it's more likely that you get it in one of these two configurations. Sad, but that's the way it is. IO affinity, um, 
<laughs> we, we talked about CPU affinity. If you thought that one was complex, IO affinity is harder. Uh, it only makes sense if you're using NV DIMMs and direct connected NVMe drives. In all other cases, the, the work is not worth the squeeze. What you do is you take your NVDIM, you connect it, you, you know which CPU you plugged it in, uh, you know which cores they have. The same CPU needs to have the NVMe drive that holds the log file. Yeah, so you have that NVDIM where the tail of the log, the log buffer goes. It's the log buffer, it goes here. And here is your log file on these drives. And now what you do is you take one core out you affinitize that one away from the CPU, so the CPU cannot use it anymore, and you affinitize it for I.O. That means what SQL Server does is it moves the log writer process to that one core. And that one core now has direct access to the drive that holds the log file and your log buffer. So what's going to happen is you have your little transaction that writes into the log buffer, the log buffer, uses this memory, most likely has a copy of that data still in that CPU core cache, and then SQL needs to write it and doesn't have to read it from the slow memory. It can read it from the fast cache and dump it to the drive. And that's what gives you the extra kick. And this is where you get from the 98.8 to the 99 <laughs> on writes. This is uh, what gives you this little extra kick at the end on a bug box. Does this make any sense if you have five, 10 cores, 12 cores? Not at all. This makes sense when you have 800 and you take one of them out, or if you have 200 and you take one out. Maybe with 60, four, you take it out, take one out. Yeah? If you have a 32 core, 16 core, whatever, don't bother. It's not worth the extra effort. Yeah. Uh, because also you most likely will not have this little device in it, yeah? Because there's very little people that put batteries into their memory chips, yeah? Um, so that's, that's that tricky part here. Yeah, and you have to use an NVMe drive with a driver that actually lets you affinitize on which core the driver runs, yeah? Uh, if you don't have that, you have to run a PowerShell script every time you reboot uh, uh, the box and set the affinity for that driver. Uh, you can do that in Windows, but it's better if the driver has like a registry setting where you literally tell it run on this core uh, and it fires up. This is not out of the box. This is tens and hundreds of hours discussing this with the support of the vendor to finally give you that registry key. Or faster way is you go to, uh, you use a component that was used in a benchmark and in the benchmark, they will have done that. So it has to be in the full disclosure report that has to be publicly available. So this is how you get the information. And you have to turn off persistent log buffer. It's a funny command that probably no one, it's, it's, it's uh, all the database, it's per database. Um, so, I.O. affinity, low latency, definitely. High concurrency, definitely. High throughput, yes. Um, maybe not all day, but during loading your data warehouse, that makes a big difference. If you have a really big data warehouse with petabytes of data in it, that means lots of data comes in every day. If you can quadruple 10 times make your log writes faster, that helps you loading your data warehouse. Generic and virtual servers, no way. Makes no sense whatsoever. Yeah? You have any high-end special things? IO affinity makes sense. Uh, if not, thing is, but only if it's really big boxes. If it's smaller boxes, as I said before, take that with a grain of salt. And same here, unless you have the battery thingy, uh, it's not making much sense. Yes, and on the data warehouse, you have to set CPU affinity and that trace flag. On the other ones, you don't set that trace flag. Just a reminder. I concurrency and throughput, I have no idea. So what you can do these days, eight sockets times 28 cores is 224 sockets. That's this guy. Um, 
how you do this. So you connect NVMe drives again to CPUs and then the next one uh, and the next one and so on. Um, and don't do that. So when you pair them like as a, as a RAID one, do a software RAID on them, uh, which is what you do on NVMe drives, it's a good idea to connect them to the same CPU. That bears some availability risk because what if one of the CPU fails, you can't, if you restart your server, these drives are all gone. You might want to make the decision to pick the second one where you have the drives again in a RAID 1 and then connected to CPUs that are directly connected. The third option I showed, the one we should not do is to put the drives that are paired in a RAID 1 uh, on CPUs that are not directly connected. So in this case, what's the path from seven to one? Seven to one would be seven, three, and then one. So that's the bad idea. Don't do that. Yeah. Uh, so this makes it a little bit trickier to balance the drives across the whole thing. But when you have a machine that big, you might want to spend some extra hours to get it right. Yeah. High throughput storage. Uh, you can sacrifice storage latency for capacity. Um, and that's how it's done. Uh, <laughs> You have your normal uh, PCI Express uh, connector cards that uh, basically con convert PCI Express in NVMe. And then instead of connecting the drives directly, as we did before, uh, what you can do is you could can put PCI Express switches, which are usually in the storage boxes. Um, um, and so you take four 16x network cards or storage cards, <coughs> you connect them to 80 port switches, which then you connect to 69 port switches, uh, which you then can connect to uh, 32 drives each. Yes. Yeah. Um, and that allows you to put in a single U box these days, 32 times 32 uh, terabytes, which is basically one petabyte in one U, and you can connect it uh, to uh, an eight socket machine twice. So you can put two petabytes of direct connect storage to an eight socket machine and run this as a data warehouse at blazing speed. Uh, so in the meantime, the slides are six months old. Uh, 16 and 32 terabytes are available. 32 terabytes are a little bit slow, uh, but they, they are available, yeah. Um, so that's the preview on the storage. And again, I'm planning on doing a much more detailed like the first one. Thank you. Uh, that's no longer available, uh, but my email address is available if you have very detailed questions or so. It might take me a couple of days to answer, especially because I'm currently moving between houses. Um, uh, so it might be a little bit delayed, but I will do my best to answer them or answer questions right now. Yeah, so we do have a couple of questions. Um, the first one went back a little bit to when you were talking about drives. The question is, well, what about hybrid drives as an option? Um, no, they, they, so it, it's very simple. Hybrid drives work when you write a little bit to them and then you read a lot from them. If you write a lot to them, like a restore, they run fast for the first three minutes uh, and then they're crawlingly slow. Um, you don't want to be that. The problem is in your day-to-day -day workload, they are probably just fine. The problem comes when you have a disaster recovery, like you drop the table and you have to restore the database from backup. And then suddenly the, the whole performance is gone on the box. Yeah. So it's, it's the same thing when you go with cheap SSDs and then you write a file to them, they are perfectly fine. You write a large file to them, the first three, five minutes go great because they have a memory buffer on them 
little actual DRAM buffer and they write to that and the speed is great. But thing is, if you look at all the, all the spec sheets, and I'm not talking about the ones that they publish on their website in fancy colors and marketing. I'm talking about the deep ones they bury as deep as possible, but they legally have to give you is there are two write speeds and there are two read speeds. There's burst and sustained. And you for restores, you have to take the sustained speed that you can endure during the whole process of writing the whole drive. And that's the one you have to use to calculate how long a restore takes. Just imagine a hybrid drive. You have three gigabytes per second for while you can burst and you can write to the NVMe part. And then suddenly it dumps down to 200 megabytes from three gigabytes. That's 100x slower. Yeah. So your first five minutes of restore go well fast. And then the rest, you wait and you wait and then you get fired. So my tip is hybrid drives have no use on a server. They're great on your home workstation because most of the files you use on a daily basis are on the SSD part and all your home videos that you watch twice a year uh, is, is on the hybrid drive, is on, on, the, is, uh, on the spinning part. Yeah? I, the workstation I'm working on right now has a hybrid drive and I'm absolutely happy with it. Would I put everyone in a server? No. Makes sense. Next. Um, that's also a little bit nicer to hybrid drives than I am, but that's fair. Uh, <laughs> next, do you have a presentation on vendor butt kicking? Because you do a good job of it. And then we started talking about um, AK as a service, and this seems like a good idea. I could make a talk how to talk to vendors. I'm pretty sure they will send an assassination squad. <laughs> Get rid of me. <laughs> the, the problem is that the first step of talking to vendors like that is you got to have enough leverage. Like if you're a, for a fairly small customer, I want to buy yeah. one server. Yeah. There's not nearly as much pull. Yeah, it, it's probably something I'm 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 creating an idea now. Yeah, uh, it's it's a movie I saw many years ago, the Dallas Bias Club. Uh, it's like yeah, but what if all the small people that buy one box team up and buy them through like a broker in the middle, that could be a new business selling service for, for many people, something like this. Yeah. Other than that, yes, you need the leverage uh, and you need to know your stuff. Uh, and the, the, the best tip I can give you is all the vendors brags with benchmarks. They do it, but there are two kinds of benchmark official ones and ones they just put on their website. The ones they put on their website don't count. Always look at the official TPC benchmark group. If one of their servers is there, and if one of the servers is there, there is a full disclosure report. That's about a 300 page PDF. Yeah. Wait for a long weekend, like upcoming Memorial Day, download it, print it, put it in a binder, take your family, go to the beach, let them have fun. You have the fun while drinking your margarita. Uh, and read that thing because in that full disclosure report they have to tell you everything they change on that server thing is and once you know that you can talk then to your vendor and says i want the exact same thing because that sounds awesome compared to what you normally sell me yeah uh that's it yeah it's i'm 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 in the fortunate uh thing is that i work for usually companies that have very good relationships with vendors and the vendors, when we ask jump, the only question we get back is how high and not why would we jump. Um, and, but again, I try to share as much as I can. I always have to keep a little bit secrets for myself so I can keep my job. Uh, but um, in, in regular, I, I try to share a lot. Yeah? And I'm, I'm really working hard on putting this all on paper so that it's not just a presentation, but you can read up the details. As you can see, if for people, thing is a lot of these slides were actually screenshots from uh, a very, very long uh, paper on how to do hardware. Um, and hopefully a long winter. So the, the COVID was great because I got a lot of hours in last year 
and looks like we have another winter of uh, being careful and not doing everything we want. So there's a chance this will actually get me to the finish line on that thing is other than vendors, just be prepared with facts. And facts will always win in the end. Yeah? They will do all kinds of tricks and they try it with me. They go behind my back. They talk to other people in the company. It's hilarious. The most important thing is that you and your manager and his manager, and if there's one more layer than that person too, um, are behind you. Yeah. So you have to convince these guys first that every time the vendor comes to you directly, pull me into the meeting. So every time the vendor does say something, you can call bullshit. Yeah. And after a while, they stop doing the bullshit. Yeah. It because they realize, yeah, they will buy from us, but only here we have to do regular business. Here's good quality work for good money and not just give you the first thing that's uh, in our minds. Yeah? Every time you ask a vendor, yeah, just send me a server, they go into the inventory. What's the crappiest thing we still have around and want to sell? Yeah, That's the one you get. Yeah, If you tell them exactly, when, when I order from a vendor, I have their part numbers listed. This is what I want in this box. And this part in this one, yeah? And the moment you put it in, please send me the serial number because I want to verify it when it arrives that actually the correct one is exactly where I need it. Yeah, and they do that. Yeah, I don't know if they do that if you just buy one or if you have to buy like a hundred or so. Um, but yeah, it's step one, make sure you and your managers are aligned in the goal that you want better hardware from the vendors, yeah? That's the first step, because if that's not the case, the vendor, the sales guy will immediately figure out, ah, that's a guy that knows what he's doing, I have to talk to his boss, because that's much easier to convince this guy, yeah? They, they go up till they find someone who they can impress with bullshit, and that's how they do it, and you just have to stop the, the bullshit as much as possible. So now a company, <laughs> yeah, some, some vendor sales guy comes in, and suddenly I get a phone call from from uh, thing and have to join uh, that meeting. Yeah, uh, and then they know. Yeah, we can't we can't still tell stories. And these days it's much easier because these days uh, <laughs> the manager just clicks on Zoom and says, "Add one more one more person to the meeting." <laughs> you don't have to physically walk to the other floor. So yeah, that's my answer for, for how to talk to vendors. But yeah, good idea to make it a talk. I, don't, I, will, I will think about it. I don't promise, but I will think about it. All right, thank you. And with that, we are going to wrap up for this evening. So we appreciate everybody coming into chat and we'll catch you next Tuesday, or this upcoming Tuesday. For uh, Shabnam Watson talking about Power BI, Monday we have Shop Talk, so we'll hope to see you there. Until then, have a wonderful evening. Yeah. Thank you, everybody.